Words from the Gospel. The crowd asked John, what then should we do? In the name of God's source, word, and life-giving spirit. Amen. At summer camp one year, everyone got the same bracelet. A simple fabric band with the letters WWJD stitched in large, white, capital letters. Having never seen the bracelet before, I didn't know what the meaning of WWJD was, but one owner explained the coded message. What would Jesus do? The bracelet was both a fashion fad and a shortcut to Christian decision-making in daily life. Handily available on your wrist, it was intended to guide you through the day. WWJD would help you live out your calling to follow Jesus and aid you in making him known to the world through Jesus-like decision-making. I never got the bracelet. In fact, I will confess that after a few days, the bracelet and the owners of the bracelet, they kind of annoyed me. Wearing a little bracelet asking you to reflect on what would Jesus do is no guarantee that when the time comes, you would actually do what Jesus would do. I had sense enough to understand that Jesus' decision-making is rather ahead of my own decision-making. But today our gospel invites us to reflect on another J name, John, for John the Baptist. John is sent to prepare the way for Jesus and sent to preach a message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And in today's gospel, three times we hear the question, what should we do? So today I'd like us to reflect on the question, what would John do? John is introduced with the words of the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. John told the people that to prepare for this new kingdom, they needed to repent and undergo a ritual, a baptism in the River Jordan. John's message was new because John was saying to the people of Israel that in the kingdom to come, you are not guaranteed salvation by being a descendant of Abraham. Your lineage and your ancestry are not important. John's message meant a renunciation of all presumptions based on ethnicity. This is expressed forcefully when John says to the crowd, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Ultimately, John's repentance is a repentance not only of ethnicity, but of one's own self-sufficiency. Instead of a kingdom based on which group we belong to, John preached the message that told anyone who would listen that to prepare themselves for God's kingdom, they must repent and be baptized. It was an invitation to everyone, even the hated collaborators with the Roman Empire, the tax collectors and the soldiers were invited by John to repent and prepare themselves for this kingdom. John's repentance and baptism helps us to realize that to prepare the way for Jesus, to come into our lives, we simply have to accept that our salvation is not up to us. We prepare ourselves by letting go of our self-sufficiency and turning to God with the knowledge that when we emerge from under the water, something new will be done by God. What would John do? Means preparing the way for Jesus by accepting that everyone is welcome in God's kingdom. What would John do? means preparing the way for Jesus by accepting that no matter what your history, no matter what has gone before, baptism is enough to make you a member of God's kingdom. What would John do? means preparing the way for Jesus by accepting that you are not the author of your salvation. God is. In the world of Christian iconography, John has been depicted pointing at Jesus. In fact, in many icons, his arm and finger are abnormally long. To give you an image, from fingertip to fingertip, LeBron James can reach seven feet and one inch. So you stick his right arm on my body and you sort of get the picture of the John icons. The exaggeration is, of course, on purpose because it's meant to capture that John's ministry points to Jesus' ministry. 
what would John do? He would point to Jesus. In Luke's gospel, John leaps for joy in Elizabeth's womb when Mary visits her. From conception, John points to Jesus. In our passage today, John's teaching is remarkably like the ethical teaching of Jesus. What would John do? Share your goods with others. Give the poor justice. Treat each other with kind sensitivity. Do not use positions of power to exploit others. It points to Jesus when he says, do unto others as you would, as you would have them do unto you. John's teaching is also something simple and achievable. Do what you feel you can do. It may seem small at first, but eventually it will change your life. That reminds me of how Jesus had to start slowly with the disciples. It takes time, but God never asks the impossible. Even in his manner of death, John points to Jesus. In prison, calling out the king for his illicit marriage, John, like many prophets before him, will end up losing his head. John's death points like nothing else to the fate that awaits Jesus in Jerusalem when he has his own run-in with the authorities there. But John is very clear about why he is pointing to Jesus. I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus will come. John's life and death, John's teaching and his baptism are all pointed towards the one who is greater than he. I would like to step away from what would John do for a moment. Today you will have noticed that we lit the rose-colored candle on our Advent wreath. It's Gaudate Sunday from the word rejoice, from Paul's letter to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always again I say rejoice. The color rose is meant to lighten the spirit of Advent, focusing our attention on the joy and gladness that comes with the promise of Jesus. So it's a Sunday of joy, but I have to confess, when I read our gospel, John the Baptist doesn't seem to ring out with gladness. You brood of vipers, the axe is lying at the root of the trees, the winnowing fork is in his hand, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. I cannot say that I feel joy when these words of stark judgment, with these words of stark judgment, because we start to wonder, and what about me? How am I doing in preparing the way of Jesus? How am I doing at pointing to him in my life? Am I bearing fruit worthy of repentance? John's words of judgment tell us what is good will be kept safe but what is wrong will be destroyed forever it's an uncomfortable image but not an entirely negative one i think we all have this desire that one day god will set things right that god will truly bring justice that all that is good in the world and in ourselves will finally be kept safe and all that is evil will be destroyed forever in the verses that follow our gospel, Jesus arrives on the scene. And instead of ringing out words of judgment, he slips into the waters and is baptized like everyone else. In Luke's gospel, it's almost a non-event. But there is something beautiful and of great importance in Jesus' baptism. Most of us don't remember our baptism. For some of us, it would have been a nice day out at church in our fancy best with a little bit of sprinkling of water and some nice photos. John's baptism was different. He was pushing people fully underwater in the Jordan to symbolize being made clean, but also a death to their old life. You died, so to speak, in the water, and you were raised up out of it to start your new life with God. And that is what Jesus did. He didn't judge, but came to share our human condition to the full. He plunged his head under the waters and symbolically died. 
Later on the cross, he would plunge to the lowest point of the human condition and die. In the Jordan River, a voice from heaven rings out, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And I think that is important too. It is not when Jesus is teaching up a storm or healing the sick or feeding the multitudes that God comes. But in this symbolic moment, when Jesus is in full solidarity with us, at our lowest point, it's here that God speaks. Jesus is the one who is king, and he has the right to judge us. But instead, he chooses to be fully one of us. He shows us that true mercy goes far beyond justice. God just doesn't give what he has to spare. Like the second coat that John the Baptist tells us to share with the person who has none. God gives everything, even the life of his son. And discovering that God is like that is truly a reason to rejoice. Spiritual author Henri Nouwen writes that joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved, and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, or even death can take that love away. So friends, rejoice. Rejoice as we wait for the one who slipped into the waters of the Jordan with us. Rejoice as we wait for the one who chose not to judge, but to offer mercy. Rejoice as we wait for the one who shows us the heart of God's unconditional love. Amen.